Smith, the same fellow who had put together the early uh, uh, mechanical system. Now, we have the 1936 field test receiver, the one that's sought after by many people. The RR359 9-inch screen was designed for use in the 343 line tests. This 32-tube set plus CRT used older 6D6s, some octals, as well as experimental types. Several separate video and audio IF strips were employed. The picture was still green and black. And a rear view of the 359. Note the IF amplifier tubes uh, mounted, uh, mounted vertically to reduce lead length between, between the stages. The set had an elaborate power supply with two low voltage and two high voltage rectifiers. It even had a pair of two A3s for audio output as well as bass and treble controls. Also featured were coarse and fine vertical hold controls. November 1936, broadcast station executives from around the country were invited to see a demonstration of the RCA TV system. Almost 300 attended a viewing of the RR359 sets on the 60th floor of the RCA building, and, and they ended up getting a free lunch. This is an RCA uh, promo. This, on the back of this uh, photo, this set, of course, was never sold to the public. But this picture shows you, this is their RCA's words, this picture shows you how the National Broadcasting Company's experimental television is being received in the homes of a small group of engineers. The receiver set, which is in a state as experimental as television programs, is about the size of a console radio. On December 12, 1937, this mobile system arrived in New York City for NBC. Motor, one motor van provided two iconoscope cameras and all support equipment. The second van contained the 177 megahertz transmitter with an antenna, which they transmitted to the, uh, to the uh, Empire State Building for retransmittal. Then, in 1939, this famous picture of uh, RCA presents the 440 line television to the public at the New York World's Fair in 39. The equipment was still experimental. The FCC had not given its approval yet. This is a, the, the TRK probe publicity photo. This 1939 RCA publicity photo demonstrates the 12-inch $600 combination TV and radio. It was first presented to the public at the opening of the World's Fair, tuned channels 1 through 5, 44 through 90 megahertz. Finally, the picture was in black and white. And this is the rear view of my particular TRK-12. And a very unusual thing here, anybody who's done TV repair in the, in the 50s, when you pull the chassis to take it to the shop for a repair, you would write the new person's name on the back. And if you look there in red letters, you see the name, barely read it, Sarnoff. So I have the suspicion that this, this set at one point was in the Sarnoff family. I was afraid of that. <laughs> anyway, the tube complement, 23 tubes, in, including the 12 AP4. In addition, the audio amplifier was included as part of the separate multi-band receiver, which I guess most of you, most of you know. And then, uh, of course, the nine, the um, this is the uh, this is the nine-inch nine set or the five? I guess it's the this is the nine-inch set, and that's the TRK5. And then, of course, the TT5. And I've seen uh, um, articles in magazines talking about the fact that the, uh, you notice now that they got television, they, they pushed the, the radio off into the corner. The fact of the matter is, as you, most of you realize, this set did not have a sound system, and you had to connect it to the, to the radio to, to, get, to get your sound. RCA developed everything. They developed the cameras, they developed the control room, they developed the transmitters, they developed the antennas, they had, they had everything. And this was, uh, this was the, your official RCA TV antenna. In March of 1940, scenes from an opera were telecast from the NBC studio. 
Notice the extensive lighting. According to RCA, during the, the year from its first initial World's Fair telecast, RCA broadcast 601 hours of programming. Test patterns were on the air for an additional 800 hours. It was estimated at that time there were 3,000 sets in use in the New York area in April of 1940. And you look, you look at, that, at that lighting system. <laughs> I mean, it's... <laughs> I don't know how they I don't know how they stood it, but uh, again the same the same camera style. Finally, the the FCC authorized official authorized broadcasting, and this is the first this was the first week of of official television broadcasting, and this is this is your weeks. TV on N, what, this is NBT, what became NBC. This is your week's TV. And uh, it was a big deal. But you know, you figure people that had the, at least the TRK-12 were paying about the price of a new car for this TV set. This NBT, uh, NBC first week schedule was provided to all TV owners in the New York area. Viewers were requested to give written opinion of the shows watched. Most programming was for a couple of hours in the afternoon and between 9 and 10 in the evening. Incidentally, the FCC had authorized the line rate to be increased to 525 in May of 1941. With the coming of World War II, Although shows continued to be broadcast, television was sidelined until 1946. In fact, in May of 42, FCC limited NBC and CBS to a maximum of four hours of TV broadcasting a week. This is a, this is a studio camera in, uh, ad in, 19, in a 1945 magazine, one of the many systems that RCA would be making available to TV stations which would be coming on the air in the years after World War II. The 1936 iconoscope camera was still in use in December of, of 45. Then comes the image orthicon. There were three co-inventors of the image orthicon. Albert Rose, Paul Weimer, and a third fellow who I didn't, but I met two of them and, and, uh, and interviewed them. And they lived in Princeton, New Jersey in the, in the late 80s. In June, June in, in June of 89, I interviewed uh, Dr. Albert Rose. And it was this, this uh, iconoscope was first demonstrated to the public in October of 45 at the Army-Navy football game later that year. The image orthicon. This pickup tube is about 100 times more sensitive than the iconoscope. The image multiplier section at the right provided a gain of five, and the signal multiplier on the left increased that by a factor of 20. According to my 1952 Allied radio catalog, this exotic tube cost nearly as much as a new car. And I understand they did send them back to RCA to be rebuilt when they would, uh, when they would uh, fail. And this is the famous TK-10A uh, studio camera. This camera became available in the late 40s. It used a type 5655 image orthicon. And finally, the operator had a CRT viewfinder usable in bright light studios. The camera was equipped with a lens turret with lenses ranging from 35 millimeter to 13 inch. Optical focusing was accomplished by a knob on the side of the camera which moved the pickup tube assembly with respect to the lens. And the operator had a headset which produced program sound in one earphone and studio direction in the other. The 630TS. Service data, 1946, T1 explained, the 630TS is a 30-tube direct viewing 10-inch table model television receiver. The receiver is complete in one unit and is operated by the use of seven front panel controls. Features of the receiver include full 13 ca uh, channel coverage, FM sound system, improved picture brilliance, AFC horizontal holds, and on and on and on. The set cost a typical month's pay, and yet millions of them were sold. I mean, people must have mortgaged their houses to buy these things. 
Uh, many manufacturers paid royalties to RCA to put their name on similarly designed sets or even buying the chassis and put them, putting them in their own cabinets. Around 1947, we were living not far from New York City. I remember watching Texaco Star Theater along with half the neighborhood on one of these sets. It never occurred to us that the picture was too small. Now, RCA wasn't sitting still, and this experimental color camera with special semi-transparent mirrors were employed to separate the image into red, green, and blue components. Picked up, each picked up by, uh, by an image orthicon. This is, this, the three primary colors are recombined in the tricolor picture tube. On October 10th, 1949, RCA demonstrated to the FCC their all-electronic compatible color system. And that same day, TV show Kukla, Fran, and Ollie became the first regular television program to be seen simultaneously in color in black and white. The first shadow mask color tube was demonstrated in the lab just before the end of 1949. And here's the guy that did it. RCA, having invested millions of dollars and years of effort, was finally able to make money on TV by 1949. They owned most of the patents, had the cameras, studio equipment, transmitters, receivers, all sought after by news stations and viewers alike. David Sarnoff's multi-million dollar gamble, gamble finally paid off. And these are uh, some of my uh, references. And, uh, my, my whole point, though, in, in this program is to point out that putting, television, putting a television system together was nothing like putting a radio system together. The first radio broadcast uh, of a commercial was uh, Frank Conrad in, in 1920, and he took his ham, tra ham transmitter and put a, uh, a phonograph record uh, in, in front of the microphone, and people could put together for a, a few cents or a few dollars a radio and listen to it. And, our, and uh, Westinghouse said, hey, great, we're going to turn this into a business. And all it took was building a bigger transmitter, putting up a bigger antenna, and start selling radios. Television, entirely different story. It, had, it was a system, and it had to be built and designed and created as a, as a complete system, and one or two inventors just weren't able to do that. But RCA, with the, with the foresight of, of uh, Sarnoff, did that. And, uh, and uh, I, I believe he's, to me, he's one of my heroes. The guy was not uh, an electronic genius, but he knew how to gather money and spend it wisely, and now we have a TV system. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot. That, 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 that was excellent. The next generation has to go to MIT to learn this stuff. But let me tell you, this is a quick PS. 1946, Pop brought home a 6.30. The whole neighborhood would come down to watch Rilton Burl every Tuesday night. And then one day, reading Electronics Magazine, they had a circuit on how to convert it to the CBS mechanical color system that was still transmitting from the Empire State Building. And I did that. And my father came home to watch the Friday night fights, and oh boy, did I take a licking. But uh, that, and then the last story, when I started getting interesting into, into the CT100s, this was about the 1980s. And I moved to Connecticut, and a whole bunch of retired GE executives were there that I met. They helped GE break up RCA. So I went to them and I said, scour the archives, go to Schenectady, whatever it takes. I want everything in the warehouse that says RCA, schematics, tubes, I don't care what it is. They came back a couple of weeks later and said, Don, GE emptied every warehouse and trashed everything. There's no archive left of RCA in the GE company. So that was a big disappointment. Uh, you're not going to be disappointed with uh, the rest of the presentations. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. What we're going to do now... Hey, Lee, did you carry in the uh, Royal Sovereign for us? Well, c come on up. You're going to tell us 
about working on the biggest monster available commercially. The CRT you can turn into a swimming pool if you turn it upside down. Everybody hear, hear me okay? All right. Um, this is what happens when you like um, get blasted off a, uh, a stepladder 15 feet off the ground with a pressure washer. <laughs> That's why I'm a little slow today. I did my wily e. coyote imitation. You know? All righty. Before I begin, um, there's a lot of people I'd like to thank. Um, six or seven years ago when I first embarked on this crazy journey of uh, television restoration, I barely knew uh, an electrolytic from a tubular, you know, but because of all some very fine people on the antique radio forums and uh, Video Karma, um, I learned, um, you know, a lot of these people made available to me, you know, through their, their time and effort, all their years of expertise, and there's just some of these people, there's a few I like to recognize. Anyways, um, either they go by their names, if I know them, or by their, uh, by their handles on antique radio forums. So here we go. Uh, Dennis, uh, Mr. Detrola has been uh, helpful for years. Uh, Tom Albrecht, Tom Schultz, Eric H. I think he, he's the one that does all the Admiral TVs. Uh, my good friend Henry Knoyer, uh, of course uh, Steve Pelock, uh, Phil Nelson, my god, uh, he was one of the first sources I, uh, I uh, acclimated myself to, to, you know, to learn all the basics. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Chuck Azzolina, of course, has been helpful down through the years. Steve McVoy uh, has been a great help. Um, Plus all these other guys, French Markey, Noise Box, Wisco Jim, Radio Rich, Zenith Fan, and last but certainly not least, uh, the weekend hacker, uh, Kirk Murray, uh, sharpshooter extraordinaire in terms of troubleshooting this set, including the Royal Sovereign. So without, you know, for, to all those gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm nothing without you. Now the Royal Sovereign. Uh, before I begin, I saw a little history about the set. Uh, I got the set about three years ago. Um, about three years ago, I was featured on, a, uh, on the New England Cable News uh, Network. Uh, they interviewed me in my home uh, because I was, uh, again, a restorer of very, very old television sets. And uh, a gentleman um, out on the West Coast apparently had seen the broadcast. So when I made inquiries for a royal sovereign that was for sale, he knew who I was. And he says, I know you. He says, you're the guy who restored those Dumas TVs. I go, yeah, I am. And he says, well, my grandfather was the, uh, one, of the, uh, exec one of the vice presidents of Sprague capacitors in the 50s. Uh, and this is his set. So he gave me his set, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, it's just a couple of oil caps. Uh, they s sort of like... Uh, uh, let me just go to a couple of more pictures here. Anyways, uh, that was one of the last things I had to replace in the set. One of the oil caps blew in the uh, main chassis. Uh, here we go. I was always scared to death of this television set. But I figured, okay, I'll tackle the high voltage chassis first. It's in great shape. It was in great shape. It was just covered by a little, you know, surface layer of dust. There was very little corrosion to speak of. Uh, all the tubes pretty much tested fine. Uh, this is me typically when I go through a set. I always take a gazillion photographs because, you know, I, I want to know where I've been and I want to know where I'm going. 
That's the uh, high voltage chassis. That handles just the high voltage anode. It doesn't even do a uh, horizontal deflection. There's a separate uh, section for that. It's got those huge honking uh, doorknob caps. There's three of them. It's basically, twin, uh, it's twin construction, two 1B3s, two 6PG6s. It's a powerhouse. Uh, and it basically just sort of went through and documented all this stuff. Underneath the cans, uh, that's the uh, oil fill cap. Again, uh, moving right along. I'm going to uh, quicken this up a little bit. Hold on one sec. All right. So what I did basically was, uh, after I documented everything, I, uh, I restuffed all the caps underneath the, uh, the chassis, uh, used everything uh, uh, much higher uh, wattage and voltage rec uh, reg uh, rated than uh, from the factory. Uh, I got the uh, high voltage chassis all cleaned up. And let's see. Yeah, I, uh, I did a good bit about a cleaning. All that wiring on those jackets, I wanted to know if they are in good shape. All the rubber and everything was all, all nice and uh, flexible and pliable. The, the chassis was in great shape. It was just one that the anode had to, uh, had to fix the uh, grommet there and uh, jacket it in cases of shorting. There were all the tubes all cleared up, all cleaned up. I tested all the tubes. They were, they were pretty much all spot on. Now I'm going through the main chassis and I'm recapping a little at a time. Now, it's a pretty daunting set. So what I was doing is I was, I would do a few caps and then, you know, I would uh, plug the chassis into the main chassis, into the high voltage chassis and run it. And, uh, you know, just to make sure everything was on the up and up. I changed that, Chuck, don't worry. <laughs> Uh, the tuner uh, didn't take much. It was uh, it was freely rotating. It just needed a good cleaning, a good lubing, and uh, cleaning of the coils. One of the uh, relays was gone. Fortunately, I had the relay in stock, so I just swapped it out. That's uh, in the high voltage chassis, and that basically switches it on and off. If all is well with the main chassis, sort of a safety factor. That's M6 and M7. That handles the uh, horizontal and vertical deflection sections. So if any of those things are not working, the set will not work. It shuts itself off. It protects it. And that's because it doesn't want to, like, spit out a white line phosphor and burn a 30 uh, BP4. So there's a lot of protection circuits on this TV. The cabinet was in beautiful shape. Fortunately, it, it didn't need any restoration whatsoever. It's strictly electronics. There it is up and running, 20 kilovolts. Glowing away, there's the OA3 uh, voltage regulator tube that's showing that everything is up and running. And uh, not so daunting when you know what it is and know how to respect it. There's the high voltage regulator control. You can control, you can jack it up all the way up to 25K. 20K is what I used for this, which is a 27RP4, brand new. There it is on the test rig I've got. There it is with all the Dumont uh, equipment uh, on the tail. And I got a raster, but no signal. And it turns out um, I thought there was something amiss in one of the IF sections, but it turns out I had just crossed a couple of caps, one cap in one of the IF stages, and it was killing the video signal. And uh, this is just uh, some more close-ups of the uh, test rig I used for the uh, CRT. There it is. Finally got a raster. Off kilter and all that stuff, but uh, I eventually straightened it out. Then I, uh, it wasn't uh, as crisp and clear as I did, so I went through all the IF stages and I found that some of the resistors were way out, you know, so being careful to keep the same dress lead and everything, I replaced them and bingo, it bounced back nice. I tell you, after all that time, it was nice to see that. 
So what do you do? You watch a movie. <laughs> I love film noirs. They're the best. Yeah, I had the thing on the bench for running for about a good five or six hours, and after that I figured, well, okay, nothing's blown up yet, so it's time to really start putting it into the TV, into the cabinet. There's our buddy Sterling Hayden. So, basically, uh, that's the back of the cabinet. Everything in this thing cosmetically is like superb, inside and out, you know. It, uh, it led the charmed life. Just going back in there. Okay, so, how do you put a 27 RP4 into a cabinet which is meant for a 30 BP4, but in a non-destructive fashion? Well, well, these are basically just close ups with all the factory marks inside the set. Hold on a sec. Close ups of all the uh, factory literature and uh, schematics. Yeah, these are all those Lucite, uh, you know, those four block mounts that I used them to do the 30 pv 4 I decided to use that as part of the mounting system for the adapters for the 27RP. My goal was to create a mounting system that was completely non-destructive. I did not have to drill one hole whatsoever uh, in the cabinet or, or anything else in the Duma. At first I was thinking of, okay, this is what I used. I used, a, basically it came down, was a piece of uh, artboard, painted black. Um, this is some, some abortive, tents of, abortive attempts of some sort of a mounting system I was coming up with the uh, CRT. There's the mask. You can barely see it, but it's in the uh, old Dumont mask. Hold on. There's the bottom um, jig I came up with. And you can see it fits right in with the loose side stuff. Uh, all these webs out there basically cradles the bottom of the uh, 27 RP4. Bolts in place. There's the uh, mask uh, from the, for the 27 in front of it. And I sort of try to keep all the geometries and stuff like that, you know, in a very Dumont-like fashion. It turns out, me making the, uh, the mask and the mounting system for the 27 took me far longer than restoring the whole set itself. This is where most of the work actually went into the restoration. Okay. It turns out that in terms of geometries, the tail shaft on the 27 is within a quarter of inch of a 30 BP4. So I didn't have any problems in terms of deflection or, you know, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, compatibility issues with the, uh, the system used in the 30. It worked fine. I just had to replace one wire wound in the, uh, in the horizontal width control. That was it. There's the top part of the uh, clamping system. There's a saddle uh, array I'm using to further cushion the, uh, the back part of the uh, 27, made it out of basswood. There it is with a closed cell foam uh, strip, painted up, and you see the uh, coupling collars back uh, top and bottom, painted black. That's on the guest bed upstairs. And again, I try to think, what would the factory do? All right. Use the same matted uh, flat black they used in the inside of the cabinet. That's what didn't do, that's what didn't happen to the TV when I worked on it. It didn't go up in flames. Uh, jigging the, uh, the front mask, you know, with the Cumpley system, uh, I wanted it absolutely perfect, so when you put the TV, you know, together, you, you saw no uh, edge lines or anything like that. Here's the mounting system. Inside and out. It took me a month 
to finally get everything all jigged into place. There I am scouring the 27RP4 with Comet. It's good. It works. You know, it's a good etching compound. It really polishes glass very well. And the f yeah, that's about spot on. Try to keep the same double D mask. I uh, redagged the rear part of the, uh, the the CRT and put the labels back in place, making everything nice and neat. And I think that looks pretty factory. Uh, so it's the final assembly time. You know, for a heavy chassis, it's actually not that hard to work on. I mean, the way they have the, the main chassis propped up on the side there, it's on a ledge of wood. So you can just barely just pick the thing up while you're standing and just take it away from you. It jigs into place pretty easily. There's the front uh, tuna section right there, the control section. And there's everything installed. I cleaned all the wires with lacquer thinner. I rewrapped them with black electrical tapes, you know, just in the, in the same old factory position so everything was nice and neat and, neat and baselined. This front of the cabinet, some of my collection. Test pattern, not quite tweaked. There she is, dead center. I love that test pattern, by the way, John. It's the best. Now, when I put it in the set, I had like a, a little of a, you know, vertical jitter problem, and I thought for sure I had. Oh my God, something's wrong with the uh, vertical, uh, you know, sweep or something like that. But it turns out all it took was just a little upward nudge on the uh, vertical hole control, and everything froze really nice. There I am looking for problems that don't exist. A close up of the tune of dial. Kiss of Death, 1947. I love film noirs. I use them to uh, tweak the set because they're very difficult. There's a lot of darks, you know, and uh, when you're setting everything up, here I am setting up the automatic uh, gain control. It wanted uh, 180 volts and I set it right spot for it. Right. And then I was running the set for about, oh, about 20 hours, and it quit on me. It just shut down. Uh, the high voltage section closed off, M5 opened up, and basically just took the whole TV set offline. And the reason why it did that is because it turns out that the uh, oil filled cap in the main chassis, a 1.5 uh, microfarad 850 volt AC cap, which is tied to the power transformer, uh, went open and basically killed all the power to the main chassis. And um, they say that oil filled power caps don't fail. Oh, yeah, they can fail. The trouble is, is finding a replacement. And, you know, well, Cornell Doubler does not make, you know, 850 volt. 1.75 microfill oil fill caps anymore. So you've got to go to like a lot of the uh, the motor AC caps or uh, power supply caps and uh, double up on them. I found a couple of uh, surplus sales of uh, Nebraska, of course, a few old GE 3.5 microfarad uh, 440 volt AC uh, caps. I put them in series, measured at 175 volts, 880 volts AAC and uh, got it back going again. And uh, I'm glad. I thought for sure I wiped the set out, you know, with the, you know, the main power transformer. Well, I thought I wiped the power transformer out. But Chuck Azzolina says those things are absolutely indestructible. They were built by Solar Corporation for Dumont, and they used them on all their really great, you know, early good, uh, great early sets. They stopped using them later, I think, after the RA-109, which I guess is a cost-saving measure. And she's back. Thank God the cosmetics in that set was good, you know, because I would have hated to have, you know, had to do that cabinet over. Uh, 
There's the, uh, the cap that failed. I ended up uh, putting the caps outboard on the little cap holders uh, inside the cabinet so they get a good, uh, good amount of air. I didn't want them to fail again. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and I replaced the oil filled in the uh, high voltage chassis too. I figured it better safe than sorry. So I uh, replaced that one as well with outboard oil fill caps. So now every cap in this set has been replaced except a couple of micas and I think we can rest easy. That's a close-up of the uh, resistor chain connecting the two 1B3s. And that's it. Any questions? Well, thank you very much. You're all too kind. Um, thank you for indulging me in this lunacy, and uh, I take you back to your regular schedule program. A question? What the set? Oh, um, yeah, it was block and tackle. I basically it was on the. Uh, it's up in my loft area, and there was a. Uh, I had to literally put a huge eye bolt in the uh, the slanted part of the ceiling, and we. Took the guts out of it, and uh, with three guys, we hoisted it up with a block and tackle setup. Didn't put a scratch on it, you know? And uh, that was a lot of fun. Any other questions? Yeah, a question. <sighs> Somebody told me there's like three or four that are running in the whole country. Sort of a dark art, you know, getting them going again. There are not many people who uh, saw them running originally in the 50s or around. That's why there are a lot of friends here, you know, that helped me get it going. Question. I got one. Uh, what, you got a 119A or B or? Well, the, I think the A is a single, is a double chassis one. The B is uh, singles. Three chassis. No, okay, it sounds like an A. Another question. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, it is. I didn't have to align it, thank God, because there's so many IF stages in this thing, you know. But I just watched my lead dress. Uh, whenever I replaced the resistor, I made sure it was it's as spot on to spec as I could. I kind of mill spec all those sections and, again, watched the lead dress. Didn't need an alignment. It's, it's sharp as a tack. Question. Yes, sir. Chuck. Sure. Well, 27 RP versus uh, 30 BP. Uh, the mask basically takes up, uh, it, tr it shrunk the, uh, from the original mask back about two inches all the way around. And I kept, a, I made a double D shape on the new mask, so I tried to preserve that look. Yeah, I think I was successful. Question. Where's the original CRT? The, CR, the original CRT is busted. Uh, sort of a tragedy in shipping. Uh, but it turns out the original one had gone to air anyways, and you can't rebuild 30 BP4s anymore anyways, even in France, because it won't fit in their oven. So in retrospect, it really wasn't much of a loss. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What year did it come out? How many do we think were made? How much did it sell? Oh, I bet you there's other guys in this room who could tell you that. I think if 51, well, what mine has a production mark on the box the cabinet says 51151. So I think that's when the cabinet was made. Uh, so I got to figure they're around there. I, I guess I think there were a 1950 design. I seem to recall prototypes of a 30 in other parts of the, uh, I don't know, Dumont was you know, showing them as early as 1950. Steve probably knows. Yeah I, think they're yeah, I think that's when they were produced in 51, but I think there were 30 inch prototypes earlier than that. Uh, questions? Uh, what, Steve, what'd they go for? They seventeen hundred and ninety-five bucks, like and they were carried in the Dumont catalog through what fifty-two, fifty-three, and I think they probably blasted the last ones out the door at a reduced cost because, uh, you know, they they weren't very cost-effective at that point. Say again. Yeah, single chassis. Right. Right. 
Now, here's a question. Uh, I hear that there was like, uh, how are we doing with time, John? Am I? You're over. I'm over? Oh, okay. <laughs> Should, do I want to go? Shall I go? Last question. All right, one last question. Yeah, go ahead. Or explanation. Go ahead. Uh, you were saying, oh yeah, I, I know, I know. Uh, I heard there was a retro kit for 27 inch all glass tubes for this thing. And I sort of tried to, try to duplicate that here. Maybe somebody else could tell me that, but I heard that Dumont actually made a, a mask and replacement CRT kit for that set. I've never seen one, though. One last question. I was wondering, I see continuous tuning here. Yep. Yeah, sort of a Dumont trademark was uh, continuous tuning. That was a way of uh, squeezing FM between uh, six, channel six and seven, sort of like a, 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 a free. Yeah. Anything else? Well, again, uh, thank you all. Much obliged. John? Good show. Good show. Well, the sovereigns are going into the same warehouses as CT100s. We've got somebody working on flat panel replacements. <laughs> color and black and white. And maybe we'll have color for the sovereign size. Mike, are you here? Sure. Mike's got two presentations. He's going to talk to you about the uh, Western 41 mechanical receiver and then the Zenith field sequential. And uh, that's a trip in itself, taking you back a little bit in time. So uh, you're learning a heck of a lot today, gang. So this is the uh, the Western 41. I don't know how many of you got to take a, take a look at it in the mechanical room, but um, let's see if I get this right. Okay, no button orgs. Top one doesn't do anything. Either way, you can either use these or just use the arrow keys too. I don't know what, what I did to this. We're going to the right. Oh, okay. <laughs> then I'll hey. take you back. Well, what we're, we're going to look into is whether this is actually the ultimate mechanical television that was sold for use in the home. Sure. The, um, no, they're not changing here. That's it, I'm out of here. Yay. So this came out in 1932, 33. Why does it keep doing that to me? Backwards. And. Well, I'm getting all messed up here. <laughs> it skipped a whole bunch. Maybe I'm holding it over. Yay! Anyway, these are some of the features that were in the advertising for this set. The uh, large screen for family viewing, a brighter image than you'd see on other mechanical sets, <clears throat> higher resolution than the 24, 36 line peephole sets, uh, less flicker, holds a steadier image, built-in receiver, which you didn't have to have a separate uh, box for, and all in a compact tabletop case. The large screen, um, if you saw it back there, is definitely bigger than the peephole version. 
And the brighter image comes from this crater tube. We'll, we'll uh, go into that a little more, but that's the secret as opposed to having the <clears throat> other neon tubes with the flat uh, plate that lights up. <clears throat> this is the 45 line scanning disc, which we'll look at some more later too. And that's the um, triple interlacing, which is their claim for less flicker. And also we'll get more into this with the, uh, the new motor design that uh, helped frame the image. And built into the bottom, all on a, a chassis similar to what you'd see in a cathedral radio, they had the entire receiver built on. And then again, all jammed into this tabletop cabinet if you got a chance to take a look at it over there. If you didn't believe it, they were on display at the 1933 Chicago Century of Progress exhibit. And if you went to the exhibit, they gave you one of these little cards to put in a plaque, and you were actually televised on a screen and then displayed on the TV at the exhibit. <clears throat> so how did they do it? Uh, the next uh, slide, I've got all the different components that are in the set. Uh, knobs in the crater tube, and then the chassis, and the uh, cabinet taken apart. For adjusting it and things, it, the top slides off. To, to get the uh, bigger image, it's actually projected onto the screen. You're not looking through to the neon tube. And from the back, you can see it's a, a ground glass screen. And, um, and then through the lens assembly, it, it, there it is. So the, the little tiny point on the, um, is where it'll actually light up, project through the lens, and then onto the uh, ground glass screen. These are some close-ups of the uh, crater tube. And again, it, all the light comes from the very small area. It's a three-lead tube. The, uh, the lead for the neon lighting is on the right-hand side. And this is actually a heater element in the center. We haven't got any good theoretical explanations of what that does. And then the uh, common lead for the two, uh, the heater and the signal are on the far left. But you can see there's a little like a ceramic wrap around that and it's starting to break off on this tube already. And again, that's where the actual bright light would come. And this one, I, I magnified it about as much as I could. That's the actual, when they say it's a crater tube, that's the crater that you're actually looking at that lights up. It's mounted in the set on this uh, adjustable arm so that you can tilt it back, put the tube in, and then you can adjust it either high or low to uh, focus onto the screen. And then this is again in the line of sight, so the, um, the neon light will be there, project through the lens, and then off onto the screen. This is a shot of the, uh, the disc in it. And different than any Davin disc or anything that's just a bunch of perforated holes, these are actually a, uh, a lens in each hole. So they had to somehow make a sturdy enough disc that as it's spinning, everything stays in line to project onto the uh, screen. And I did this really as magnified as I could, but each lens is in the hole and then punched to, to actually hold it into position. And their claim for um, reducing flicker is shown by this uh, triple interlacing. So the 45 lines are divided up into three sets of 15. So every revolution, uh, I've got on the next one here, it'll do line one and line four, and then the next set would do line two, five, et cetera. The next set, line three and six, et cetera. Uh, kind of unique thing on this motor is the uh, brush windings. So you can rotate the motor to get your framing and the contacts for power for the motor keep uh, contact along those, uh, the rotor there. Uh, in this picture, it shows how the, uh, the, the knob in the front is actually turning the whole mounting for the motor. That's the frame holding the motor in place. 
and then the shaft of the motor is what goes through to the disc. So the disc is turning independently of what you're doing with the front knob. Just you're, you're turning the starting point for the synchronous motor. This is the, uh, a view of the chassis. And in their ads, they made claims uh, about how good the receiver is, saying that it's both a super heterodyne receiver and a three-stage TRF along with a re resistance co coupled amplifier. So I, that raised more questions than it answered, and as advertising, I guess, can do. And I was also curious as to why the Echophone name kept appearing on things. So when I started looking into the chassis, the uh, tuning condenser is a four-section bathtub kind of design, and that kind of sets it up as being a, a, a three-stage TRF, so you'd have one section for tuning the antenna to the first RF, another section to the second RF, to the third, and then to the detector. So I don't see where it's a, a superhead at all, but it, it was certainly a buzzword for advertising at the time. The um, tube complement, the number 80 rectifier, 5877 and 58 in the RFs, uh, 27 detector, and then uh, <clears throat> this is the uh, resistance coupled amplifier to, uh, to a number 45 output to the crater tube. Got that listed here again. Yeah. So basically, your power and then the signal would be doing a loop like that through to the crater tube. Now, I saw on the side of it something that started to answer a lot of my questions about Super Hat and about uh, some of the other things about the design. Um, RCA licensing and Hazeltine licensing. When, when the, in this vintage, RCA charged a, a high premium to have a license. It was like $100,000 a year minimum, and then 7.5% on sales over that. And if you look at the number of sets that would have been produced in this, there's, there isn't much way that it could have worked out. Uh, I'll go back and forth to the next slide. The, uh, the Western tag is actually for a serial 469. So if you assume over 32 and 33, if they made 500 units and split up between a couple of years of that and the Hazeltine license, they could have had $300,000 in royalties to pay. So what companies were doing at the time was sharing the license. Uh, go back to that. Um, the serial number 8838 is probably the serial number for Echophone. So they were a radio producer. They're listed in riders. They produced cathedral sets. So more than likely, the whole assembly or construction of chassis was farmed out to them. And uh, they also had a Hazeltine license. And if I go up ahead. Uh, Hazeltine at the time did a lot of development work on shielding tubes and on making the smaller uh, uh, coil cans. That was actually a big breakthrough compared to 1920s sets that had huge coils and unshielded tubes. And when you switch from the, uh, the O1s and, and tubes that were used in the 1920s scanning disc sets, that might have had a gain of around eight or 10, the, uh, the pentos that were in here could have had a gain of 10 times that much. So they were basically making use of uh, of the engineering at uh, at Hazeltine, the license for both Superheads and other licenses from RCA, and the construction actually being done by Echophone. <coughs> the um, Hazeltine company was also big. If you did get their license, it came with engineering support that was one of the biggest values in having their license. This is a, a picture of the uh, resistance coupled amplifier. So this except for it being the uh, AC tube version is similar to what were, would be on those little David amplifiers that uh, you see with mechanical sets. And again, this was all put into a, a very compact uh, AC operated chassis, which uh, would then you know, be able to sit on a tabletop next to a, a cathedral radio that could be receiving the sound. <clears throat> So that was kind of state-of-the-art of technology for 32, but from that company, at least, we don't see any future development. But when I was looking for ads in the same vintage magazines, 
the reason there was probably no future development was they were already saying cathode ray tubes are on the way, so research for, uh, for an improved version probably just wasn't worthwhile to anybody. And that would have been the end for, for the people at Western. So before I go on to uh, the thing about the um, field sequential set, uh, Jerome said he was going to be watching this. And I think instead of watching, you should get over and talk to those people at RACS and get them on the job. <laughs> That's a little commercial announcement. Uh, Darling, I need you to get me to the next one again. Okay, so the, the Zenith field sequential um, will recap our, our story from uh, where it started two years ago. It was bought at the, uh, at the auction in 2011, and anyone who was there and poked around with it saw that it was in pretty rough condition. The uh, chassis was sitting on phone books, the yoke coil was flying around, um, the uh, CRT was damaged couple of pictures of the CRT, and, uh, and the knobs and everything were missing from the front. Uh, when the chassis did come out, uh, there were some obvious parts missing and a lot of detective work needed to be done. So <laughs> since year one, uh, as I reported a little bit last time, we did find uh, most of the knobs were hidden in the back in a bag in the set. And I was able to do a little um, digging through all the different, I, ha I happen to have the sets of photo facts from that period, and went pulled out all the Zenith ones and found something very close. So it looks like the, uh, most of the set is an adaption of, of this monochrome model, which is in uh, set 144 of, of uh, Sam's. And also in last year, we I had disassembled the whole set. Uh, there was an awful lot of baffling for sound and uh, really heavy heavy construction inside. Checked out the magnifying lens. And I was able to find a substitute CRT, a 10SP4, which um, when I get to, uh, to trying to get a, uh, an image on, it's going to need a different uh, focus voltage setup. And the, um, I did create a circuit diagram of the little extra video amplifier that's on the CRT neck. Uh, last year, too, the color wheel assembly was removed and it was all tested out and shown to be uh, working okay. So, since our last episode, I started to look at what I had there and decided what would be the best way to display it um, and how much restoration is going to be needed if, if there wouldn't be a way to make it work. Uh, should I just do a physical display where it never really operate, a display only where there was just something cheesy with a backlight for uh, the spinning wheel, uh, restored and working but without vintage components, or a total restoration which gets into the capacitor stuffing and, and all the agonies that go along with that. Well, I, I started to look at three different questions as to how to proceed. One would be was how historically significant is the television? Uh, number two, are all the vital and unique components actually rebuildable or, or already working? And then could I have a signal to run it? Well, Daryl helped me with number three because his, his converter will run that set. So that left me with having, having to pursue number one and two. <coughs> um, when I started to look for possible reasons or, or ways this would have been built, I started to think of whether it was just some, like an unofficial project in, inside of Zenith, since nobody's found another one or any documentation on it, or was it something that maybe the engineering department was aware of and said, well, let's take one of the old uh, monitors and fool around with it, see what we can make happen? Uh, was it a challenge to the engineering guys in the department where the boss said, take your spare time and, and see what you can do with this? Was it uh, where maybe 
to test a specific idea that the marketing people come down and say, you know, we want to be in on this if it takes off? Um, or was it even further down, like a, a prototype for production or something in like the, uh, we saw in the, in the RCA sets, a, a prototype for actual home testing? <clears throat> so I started to look for clues. Some of the things that bothered me were that it's an adapted chassis, that it's not a chassis that was made to do both, that they took a monochrome one and took every empty piece of space and started to fill it with things. It was just haphazard. Any, any open spot got some component thrown into it. Um, I'll give you an example of the next one, the crude construction. Everything was just last minute kind of soldered on. There were differences in wire. Uh, this is only one example of probably 25 spots in it that are just uh, tacked on soldering. And, um, and then a lot of parts were cut and just bridged. This, there'd be a resistor removed and a new one just tacked on. So the rough parts layout, the fact that no others are known, uh, the fact that there's uh, no promotional material, I haven't seen anything in advertising. And, uh, and actually, one thing that concerned me, too, was did it ever work? <laughs> it may, it's possible that it never even worked in Zenith, and somehow it ended up getting out of Zenith. So I, I did start to look at some positive clues. Uh, there were some ID tags on the chassis uh, with a serial number that it's a special run. I mean, that, that was a, to a degree positive because it still could have been a minor in-house thing where someone was just saying, you know, take this and see what you can do with it. Another positive that I found was that there were so many design factors that were, that were put into it that would have been a lot of work if you only wanted to test the concept. You wouldn't have had to make it so quiet with all the sound baffling. Um, you wouldn't have had to have the magnifier to actually see the screen size. You wouldn't have to make it color and black and white if all you wanted to do was see if black and white, if color would work. And that it was easy with just the throw of a switch to uh, change whether you're in black and white or color. And even in a cabinet that, that fit the, uh, the high-end product line. But then after looking through a lot of 1951 and, and earlier documentation that I have, I actually found something about it in a 1953 report. Um, this is an uh, annual like report to stockholders from Zenith. Um, this this uh, 15 GP uh, set is what I, one of the sets I got from uh, Dave Johnson's collection. And they were nice enough to include this book in there, which I didn't look at right away because of the 1953 date. Well. It says right in the, um, in the story about the 15 GP22 set that Zenith was the first company to manufacture and sell uh, commercial receivers for the now obsolete CBS system in 1941, and then they talk about the monitors that they built. But they say when in, in the FCC approved the CBS system in 1950, they made a number of sets to demonstrate to the distributors. And then they go on about how uh, they didn't put them for public sale, but uh, subsequent events have proven how right they were not to do it. So then they're saying, they're claiming that a number of them were made, and I certainly felt a lot better that at least one was made. And um, they go on, now, I had to take a, with a, a little bit of a grain of salt that this is for stockholders, so if you read some of it, you think that in 1939 they invented television and color television too, because it says they were doing experimental broadcasts in 1939. They mentioned how other companies were receiving their broadcasts to, uh, to test their sets. And to my knowledge, nobody's ever heard of any of that actually happening. Also in a book called The Zenith Story, uh, they make another mention of the same um, business happening with uh, test broadcasts. They also in here claim to have made the first 23-inch uh, rectangular color set before RCA had the 21-inch round set. So they had the Roland Company build something for them, but at least one or, two, one or two CRTs were produced like that. So when I went back to my list of where it falls in, I kind of came in between these two that uh, you wouldn't make a prototype that was so crudely built, because you're not going to turn that over to production and say, make me more of these. 
And it's probably a little bit more than just testing the concept because it looked like the type of set you'd want to put in somebody's home. So that's where I landed. So um, to me, that as far as, uh, as how significant it is, I, I rated it very special. <laughs> so then that leaves me with number one and number three being go. So number two was, was the next thing to check. If I was going to try to make it work, are there some vital components that are, aren't rebuildable or, or going to take an awful lot of effort? And I made start out with making a list, um, and it was mostly transformers and coils at the top. This, um, and then on the bottom, those are ones that I've already, to a degree, resolved. <clears throat> so when I, I knew the color wheel was okay, the color wheel motor is okay, the lens is okay. Substitute CRT, which could be made to work. And when, with the uh, items I was left with, it seemed like if I can get a successful raster test, then it looks like I'd be there. But when you, when you still have to power up those vital components and you don't know too much about what else is going on, you want to remember the TV doctor's oath, first do no harm. I didn't want to power it up in some way and, um, and blow it up. And once you'd kill one of those, say, the motor, like we're having trouble with the CBS motor there now, some of those could be really um, take an extraordinary effort. And Cliff doesn't live near me, so I, I don't know if I could do that to uh, keep it going. And you don't want to be what, like this guy had to do here to revitalize that set. It's just the proton beam, just too much. So I decided to, before I'd run it from its own power transformer, to, uh, to check for capacitor failures. But I was going to do it with uh, an external power supply and not even use the built-in uh, transformer. So I, if, you, if you remove the 5U4 from the socket, and the set actually has two of them, um, and then inject a, a, an adjustable power supply at this point, you can start to slowly bring it up. You can be trying to do that capacitor reforming. I don't know how many of you might have tried uh, checking for a short like that ahead of time uh, before you'd power it up, but a lot of them, they're not going to come to the surface till after you've given the set power and, and uh, run it for a while. Uh, I learned that the hard way by uh, doing a lot of work on a RCA 721 for the InfoAge Museum. I'd recapped, I thought, everything, uh, ran it for weeks, demonstrated it to them when they got it. And then they had it for one week, and now they have a fire extinguisher with my name on it over there. So don't want to do that again. So when I did start to inject power over here, um, I, the very initial load with only 50 volts applied was like 150 milliamps. So something was, was going bad. There's no load from any tubes, no filaments are running. and. Um, and do, during some of that kind of reforming stage, it started to drop some, but then I saw that some of the cans were heating up. So I um, um, went, would go to each can and check each section, and which, whichever one seemed to have the most uh, voltage drop would, would appear out of normal. I'd cut those out and uh, eventually got it down to idling at 30 milliamps at 350 volts. So it seemed that I was ready to, to be able to apply power through the transformer. And I constructed a, a CRT holder for the replacement CRT. Before I did much of anything with the chassis, I spent some time documenting it, uh, breaking it up into a grid work, and then taking a, a high resolution picture of each grid. And um, then I set up for raster test number one. So I had a, a variac, had meters on the other side monitoring what was going on, and, uh, and applied power for Raster test number one. Uh, raster test number one looks just like the before raster test. <laughs> no raster. Um, I, I was able to hear the vertical oscillator running. And probably somewhere in the switch assembly, um, the, the big wafer switch assembly that goes between monochrome and color uh, actually switches coils in and out. It, horizontal oscillator, horizontal width, all those coils are switched on the wafers. So my first suspicion is that I'm probably not even getting a connection through on, uh, on one of those, which um, unfortunately, as far as raster number two, well, we didn't get there for this year. 
So we ended at, at sorry, we're out of time for this year. But uh, there's always next year, and the crew is, is already getting back to work for next year's update. <laughs> We've installed the uh, Small Hadron Collider, and uh, we're going to give it another shot. So will we see raster? Will we see video? Hopefully we will see color. But uh, tune in again next time. Thank you. And if I owe you some money for this. Uh... Question? Question? Yeah. If you compare the pictures of that set with known pictures of the Zenith built set for the Smith Klein medical demonstration, that totally was quite different. Similar. Total, no. No, from the, the cabinets. I haven't seen the, the inside. inside. The There's not, not yeah. one. The, the, the wheel is, the assembly looks the same. Well, no. I just figured that this might be one of those cabinets somebody... Uh, yeah, it's, it's their, their premier cabinet. Was, it was also used on a lot of their high-end monochrome sets for that time. But the, inside, there is no two components well, the same. I've never seen inside one of the Smith Yeah, Bodies. no. I had, well, I had a picture in last year's presentation, but uh, totally different. Okay. Yeah. Really? No, I, I hadn't heard anything about that. Yeah, it's, it, somebody uploaded it's on, it's on the uh, internet. Yeah. It, it looked just like this. Really? Uh, it, it was on September 1951 in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, no, it's a robot, and they even show, list the store where it was located in Cleveland. Really? And, and the set looked like this, looked actually, like, uh, yeah. for demonstration? They make reference to uh, the fact that Channel 5 couldn't monitor it. This was the only, only, it was only like two sets in Cleveland that were demonstrating that. Broadcast yeah. Certainly, I'd like to find anything that shows there could have been more than one because they could have taken this around to a couple of places to show the set was shipped in. The shipped in. Yeah. Well, I got it closer to here, <laughs> to the auction. Yes. Uh, going back to your mechanical receiver. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the, the, each company in that time period would have to send their own signal out, otherwise there'd be no way to sell sets. So they would maintain a schedule. Some of those schedules were pretty uh, elaborate, some broadcasting every day. Um, not necessarily anything you'd want to watch, but they'd broadcast something every day. I know there's the uh, slide of that first TV schedule. It said, save for posterity. Oh, that, that was in uh, Richards. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it looked like the the western was a Chicago area. Radio store. Yeah, and they might only keep one or have to order it for you or whatever. But you know, because it it wasn't going to be a, of much entertainment value because the things that they were broadcasting, some of them were just a, a still figure, and uh, some of the universities did that. Um, I think Iowa State did actual news broadcasts. I, I've seen documentation about that. Um, but otherwise, you weren't going to find the best they could get even on a news thing would be a talking head, just the, you know, a rough silhouette of a man telling you the news for the day. Yeah. Chicago, the only place. Uh, they've come up every place, so um, I, I guess it was nationally sold, but uh, the numbers just weren't big. Mm, the, the, um, it, the, the listings I've seen of different stations, they had wide power ranges. Some only had 500 watt transmitters, some had 2,000 watt, um, and some that would be up on, the receiver would have to be up more in the, what then was called shortwave, like in the two megahertz range. So the low end of shortwave, just past the broadcast band now. But, but uh, you know, just like they have arguments about formats of uh, VHS tapes and things, the set you bought, you better be where that manufacturer broadcasts because you weren't going to get anything otherwise. Yeah, Chuck? Were they all triple interlaced, all of what you said, that triple 
Uh, I think only when they went to the crater tube, right? No, they're older. Oh, older ones are too? Yeah, uh, no, no, only the crater tube worked with the lens. Yep. Yeah. What's that? Oh, no, that's, that's not uh, working yet. In fact, uh, unfortunately, I have to leave uh, late this afternoon, so I'll be packing it up today. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I did part of that last year, but um, I should have put it in again this year. It was a split wheel, so there were two sets of three filters, and then and each set would have clear on the other side. So when it would start to build up momentum, the two it was weighted so the two would separate, and, the, and then you'd have all color. When it would spin down, it, it would relax, and it would go to the monochrome, uh, the clear one being up on top. Pretty slick design. So that way you didn't have to actually slide it out of the way. Yeah. On the Western, where did it come from? Which How did I get it? Um, it was in the same collection for 20 plus years. Uh, if you ever saw the book Taylor Vision, uh, Doc Taylor, he, he uh, wrote that book and he, it was his property for the longest time. Um, and he did still remember that the guy he bought it from had two of them. So it was there, I was willing to sell him one. But it was in one place for over 20 years. And uh, Doc knew that I would uh, keep it safe when he was liquidating some things. He's, so he was in Indiana, um, and that's where it was before I got it. Yeah. I don't remember how many are in the uh, listing, uh, the, but there are a few of that model, yeah. They, they probably made more of those in the Empire State, which only has the one here and the one in the Smithsonian. But there are a few of them around. Mike, you taught me. Yes. <laughs> you taught me. Thanks. And I broke Thanks. this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, before we get into the break and you can all take a nap again, uh, we have to do a little business. Tomorrow morning, Steve and Bob Delbush are going to be breaking your arms to work on the CRT rebuilding. We have, and you'll learn later, we may have to not only rebuild black and white, but color. Having said that, there are approximately, according to Pete Texnes, 125 so CT100s with 25 working tubes, which means there are 100 CT100s that will never shine again. So I decided to make a, uh, an offering to the museum to have a profit center. If somebody will get a small flat panel that'll fit inside the set, get rid of the bad CRT, and operate the video off a good working chassis, Steve could take orders for it and make a profit for those that want a CT100 to light up again. I think that 90% of the people looking at it in the living room won't know it's a flat panel. And I think people that have the sets, and I can't say all 100 would do it, it's, it's something that they've got a big investment emotionally and physically and monetarily in, and they want to see it shine again. So I would make that offering to one of you technical geniuses. If I said this two or three years ago, John Folsom and Galanta would beat me down because they were heavily invested in 15G rebuilding. You'll learn more about the state of 15G this afternoon. So that's my profit center for Steve. Now I want another profit center. I want all of you to get up, walk around, get a cup of coffee, and write a check, and give it to Chuck Azar, so that we can come back next year and get good food and comradeship and all sorts of things that happen. And uh, hey, Chuck, where are you? Right Chuck, you can start off with my $250 to ETF. And uh, I think it's a worthwhile thing to support. So guys, have a good 15, 20 minutes. And Steve, you got anything else you want to tell him? 
No? Okay. Come back in 15, 20 minutes, and we'll go to part two. Thank you.